Well, hello and welcome to Solar Alberta's 2024 Solar Show, our 10th annual. This session is called How to Electrify Your Home. Please note that we have enabled closed captioning for this presentation. You can turn the captioning on in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. My name is Heather McKenzie and I am the Executive Director of Solar Alberta. I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge that I'm hosting you today and working day to day in Amiskwichi, Waskahegan, also known as Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of the Métis Nation. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of many Indigenous peoples, including the Papa Chase, Nehewak or Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot and Nakota Sioux, nations whose ancestors have cared for and nurtured these lands since time immemorial. We were delighted to have so many people register for this week and for this event in particular. To start, we'd like to thank Enbridge for sponsoring the 2024 Solar Show as a whole and the City of Calgary for sponsoring this exciting session today. We are happy and grateful to have them as sponsors. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Frank Crawford Following the presentation, there will be a question and answer period in which you can all participate. Um, we're going to be using Zoom Q&A for the questions rather than the chat box. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section. And also please click on the little thumbs up symbol to upvote questions that you like. The entire session will wrap up in an hour. We will be recording this session and making it available on our website and YouTube channel following the show. I'd like to encourage you all to check out our online trade show during this week. We have listed on this slide and in the chat all of the wonderful organizations who are participating in the trade show. To view their exhibitor booths, which include a listing of key solar related services, contact info and video introductions, please click on the link in the chat. Before we move forward, we're going to do a quick poll to get a sense of who we have joining us today. So please take a minute to answer the question that will be popping up on your screen. The questions rather. There they are. And while some are still doing the poll, I just want to encourage you all to take a minute, pop your name, land acknowledgement and any contact info that you're comfortable sharing in the chat now and throughout the event so that others can look you up on LinkedIn or email you and stay connected. All righty, thank you for participating. Let's have a look at the results. There we are. Lots of solar curious folks, and that makes perfect sense as that's who these lunch hour sessions are primarily for. But I'm happy to see some professionals have joined us as well. Uh, please feel free to share about your businesses in the chat. That's what it's there for. And thank you to the students who are here. It's great to know a little bit about the audience before we dump, jump in. <laughs> now, to share a little bit about who we are, Solar Alberta is actually in our 33rd year of operation. We're a nonprofit society that is dedicated to accelerating Alberta's transition to a just and sustainable energy future. We do so by advocating, educating, and serving as an industry and community hub for solar energy. Our membership is made up of over 760 individuals and 70 businesses. We also have approximately 21,000 followers on social media and through our newsletter. We provide a number of services, including managing a solar directory through our website. You can see a screenshot of the directory here on this slide and a link to it in the chat. In addition to our website services, we run a number of educational programs, as well as in-person and online networking events. Please note that recordings of all of our previously recorded solar show sessions and seminars can be found on our Solar Alberta YouTube channel. In addition to some solar show workshops that are industry oriented, this spring we will once again be running a number of online courses for industry professionals or those transitioning into the sector. Our courses are online Tuesday and Thursday evenings on three to five nights over two to three weeks. First up is the economics of grid tied solar PV. You can already register for all of our courses at the link provided in the chat. And we are also offering a new buy three get codes free bundle. This bundle includes the four technical courses on the roster. The link to purchase the bundle is also available in the chat. And recordings of these courses, 
as well as our solar show workshops are available for sale in the solar and training solar training videos section of our website. With respect to our advocacy work, we have a number of different campaigns running currently, which include template letters that you can use to contact decision makers. Please send letters today requesting the Canada Greener Homes Grant be refinanced, requesting an end to the provincial moratorium on renewable power plants, and requesting a number of key supports for solar and energy efficiency upgrades to homes and businesses in Alberta. We uh, also have free Rise Up for Renewables lawn signs available for pickup in 11 municipalities around the province. Uh, please click on the link in the chat to access all our templates and make a sign order today. Now that you know a little about us, we'd like to take this opportunity to encourage you to join Solar Alberta as a member. Membership is only $35. This week, you can actually purchase that membership with a 20% discount. The link to become a member is also going in the chat. On April 24th, we're hosting our AGM. Want to invite you all to sign up as members, attend and elect your new board. There are several vacancies to fill on the board this year. So if you're interested in applying, you're welcome to do so through our website until February 29th. With your help, we're recognizing long-term dedicated contributors to solar in Alberta by gifting them a free lifetime membership. If you know someone who has contributed significantly, uh, please consider becoming a member and nominating them for this award. We'll be accepting nominations until April 3rd, and the recipient will be announced at our AGM. And we're pleased to announce the Solar Alberta Diversity Scholarship. This scholarship, brand new, is intended for equity deserving individuals. Through the scholarship, we're seeking to promote inclusivity, amplify historically marginalized voices, and encourage diverse perspectives and participation in the solar and solar related sectors. We're awarding $2,000 to one equity deserving individual registered in an Alberta training program that aligns with our mission. We'll be accepting applications until April 30th and the successful applicant will be notified by May 31st. Eligibility details and the scholarship application are available by clicking on the link in the chat. We're thankful to Enbridge for sponsoring this scholarship. Finally, we ask that you consider participating in our 50-50 raffle. It's now over $2,300. The raffle ticket sales will close on Friday and I'll be doing the draw live at 5 p.m. during the Solar and Friends Mentoring and Networking event. Additionally, please consider donating through the crowdfunding link in the chat. The Government of Alberta is matching all donations made through that link. And now, without further ado, I'm delighted to get this session underway by welcoming our sponsor for the session, Lewis Percy with the City of Calgary. Lewis will tell us a little bit about Calgary and then introduce our speaker for the day. Welcome, Lewis, and I'm going to turn the mic over to you now. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Heather, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lewis Percy, and I work for the City of Calgary's Climate Mitigation Team. Uh, very excited to be sponsoring uh, this event today and I look forward, um, as I'm sure you do, to hearing a great presentation in just a few short minutes. Um, but first, I wanted to bring your attention to a few initiatives that are spearheaded by the City of Calgary's climate team that I hope would be of interest to you. So uh, the City of Calgary is developing a suite of tools and programs um, within our portfolio to meet citizens where, where they're at with regards to climate action. Um, and first, um, I'll cover one of them, which is our Clean Energy Improvement Program. Um, so the Clean Energy Improvement Program, or SEEP, uh, is a financing program uh, where eligible home homeowners um, can apply to the city to finance up to $50,000 in clean energy improvement. Um, and this includes things such as solar PV systems, envelope upgrades, and electrification upgrades. Uh, the city here pays the upfront cost and the homeowner then repays um, the loan over time through their property tax bill. The program is now actually in its second year um, after great success in 2023, and we're gonna be opening applications to this uh, for 2024 um, in the spring. And for more information on the application open date, uh, please sign up to the newsletter that you can find um, on calgary.ca forward slash C. Um, secondly, the city is also launching a home energy performance map. Um, so the map will provide citizens with an estimate of their energy consumption based on the building code year and size of their home. 
Um, the home energy performance map um, is directly aligned with the Energuide for Homes labeling process um, and will um, help provide a label to all residences um, within Calgary. The home energy performance map is going to launch this year. And again, for more information, you can find that on the calgary.ca home energy label program website. And finally, uh, the city is in the process of an update to our residential solar calculator. Um, so we're processing some new LIDAR data um, for the solar calculator, um, and this will hopefully improve the accuracy and coverage of our tool. Um, we do expect this to become uh, available by the end of Q1 this year. Um, the residential solar calculator um, is a tool that can be used for single family residential buildings to find the solar potential of their roof area and get an estimate of the financial viability of an install installation. You can find this as well on calgary.ca on calgary.ca forward slash solar calculator. So please, if you want any more information, I think those links have been pasted in the chat. So please do go and check those out um, on those three programs and tools. So now it's time for me to introduce um, our speaker for today's session, and that is Frank Crawford. So Frank is a civil engineer. Um, he's a certified passive house designer and tradesperson. Through his work as an energy efficiency consultant and the education committee lead for Passive House Alberta, he helps others build or renovate to a high performance construction standard while minimizing carbon and cost. So welcome, Frank. Um, that's it from me and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Lewis. So I assume everyone can hear me and see me and uh, see my slides. <clears throat> so I will uh, get going. So I am with Passive House Alberta. We are a nonprofit uh, in Alberta, and our goal is that Passive House is the standard for the built environment in Alberta and is accessible and affordable to all. And this, this talk is based on a report that Passive House Alberta got funding from the Alberta Eco Trust to create, and the report can now be found on the NBIX, which is the Emissions Neutral Building Information Exchange, which is a kind of another group below Alberta Ecotrust with funding from them, City of Calgary and City of Edmonton. And basically it's just a repository for a whole bunch of really good stuff about uh, um, electrification, emissions neutral buildings and all that good stuff. So there is the link there and it will also be in the chat. So, we're talking about how to electrify your house and to start, what is building electrification? So basically electrification deals with the disconnection from the fossil fuel distribution network, natural gas or propane, and some to all of the building systems are then switched over to run purely on electricity. The main goal of electrif electrification generally is greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Uh, however, solar PV systems can be added, they're not required, but if we do wanna to try to maximize those greenhouse gas emissions reductions, we do wanna get that solar PV on our buildings and I'll come back to uh, why this is later. So if we're going to start electrifying, here are some considerations we want to think about. So the first one is that improvements to the building envelope are recommended, especially in the cold Alberta climate. Uh, these building envelopes, that's where you get the improved comfort, uh, improved air quality, and kind of improved durability and resilience. But um, otherwise, if we still just electrify and put the solar panels on our roof, then what we can likely see or possibly see is that we're gonna see significant overproduction electricity in the summer because we have a big solar array to, to heat a kind of inefficient building. And then that's gonna be paired with a lot of grid, a lot of uh, kind of taking electricity from the grid in the winter to still heat that inefficient building. And the problem with that is in the winter right now, most of the electricity is still created by fossil fuel um, generation equipment. So it's not the best from a, from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint now. And the other downside of not doing any building envelope upgrades and not doing some of the other things we're talking about is that an upgrade to the electrical service to the house is often the default route. And how to avoid that is gonna be one of the key keys of this presentation. So before we talk about that, let's finish off electrification and why you might want to fully electrify your building. Um, the main thing, since we're talking about solar here, is that under the current microgeneration solar rules, you can only produce the same amount of electricity that you do 
um, in an average year, you can only produce that same amount as you consume. So the more electricity you consume, if you change everything from fossil fuels over to electricity, then you can put in a larger PV solar array on your site if you are fully electrified. And the other advantage of fully electrifying is you remove all combustion appliances from your house, which means you're going to have improved indoor air quality and improved safety from not having that natural gas connection, the possibility of backdrafting, and a few other uh, potentially uh, damaging things can happen from combustion. And finally, when you disconnect that uh, natural gas and they remove your meter, you save those fixed natural gas connection fees. Uh, that's those transmission fees uh, on your bill. And right now they're between $400 and $650 per year. So that's an ongoing savings from fully electrifying your building. So now back to some reasons you want to avoid that electrical service upgrade. So first and foremost, it, there's some cost associated with it. So your kind of lowest minimum cost to do an electrical service upgrade going from generally a 100 amp service to a 200 amp service is gonna be in the 5,000 to $7,000 range. And this is only if the transformer that is feeding your house has spare capacity. The power line from the uh, utility pole back to your building is either overhead or if it's underground, it's in conduit. And the cable from the actual utility meter, generally on the outside of your house, to your main electrical panel can also be accessible. So if all those things, those three things are there, then it might be the five to seven thousand range. But if any of those ones aren't, then you could easily go up to a twenty thousand um, dollar cost to upgrade that electrical service. And at that point, the electrical system or electrification process generally dies there. But those are individual costs. There are still, or in addition to that, societal costs, because the existing electrical transmission grid could accommodate one or two buildings on one block upgrading to that 200 amp service. But in order to meet Canada's 2050 goals of being net zero energy or zero operational carbon, all buildings need to be electrified. And if we all go from 100 amp to 200 amp services, essentially doubling the size of our electrical um, consumption, the grid can't handle that. And it would um, cause lots of difficulties with it. Those difficulties would be that the grid would have to get bigger. So the electrical utilities would need to um, expend capital to increase the whole size of the distribution network all the way from the power plants all the way down to your house. And they would actually like to do that because they get to charge us as the people that use the utility grid. They charge us for all of those additional costs in what is called the fixed transmission fees. And the problem is if we have to in significantly increase the size of the grid, those fixed transmission fees are going to go up, so electricity becomes more expensive, which kind of negates one of the cost savings of going to electrification. And those fixed connect transmission fees are already starting to go up. Historically, in Calgary, we've been about $180 per year, and right now we're up to about $400 per year. So it's already starting to happen. If we don't kind of minimize how much grid impacts we have, it will continue to happen. So how do we avoid that electrical service upgrade? Very briefly, we go on a watt diet with appliance swapping. We use load share devices, smart electrical panels, and a devices called splitters to connect that large solar panel. And I'll go into some details here, but obviously the report has all the, uh, uh, the details on all of these options. So the watt diet. The watt diet, I didn't invent it. Um, it was kind of come up with or invented by the people very smart people at Redwood Energy. They are an energy efficiency consulting firm uh, running out of California, California. And the whole purpose of the Watt Diet is basically how you can reduce the peak or the largest load or the largest ampers that your house will ever draw from the grid. And that peak load is calculated based on the current Canadian Electrical Code, code a whole bunch of clauses on that. But using the Watt Diet, you can reduce that peak load. So what are some of the ways? Obviously, if we're electrifying, we are going to be doing appliance swapping. So the first place to start is swapping your either natural gas dryer or electric resistance dryer with a condensing dryer 
or also an all-in-one washer and condensing dryer. And at this point, I would say you want to go to the all-in-one washer and condensing dryer because this way you have one appliance. It washes your clothes and dries your clothes. So basically, you have one appliance, you put in dirty clothes, and then two to three hours later, you come back and you get clean, dry clothes out of that one appliance. As you can see from this, this is just a screenshot from Home Depot. The cost for that all-in-one washer is about the same, or in the same range as a just a high-speed uh, washer or a high-speed dryer. So you only need one appliance instead of two appliances. And the big reason from the Watt Diet's point of view is that now these all-in-one washers or condensing dryers only need a 15 amp 120 volt circuit as opposed to your large electric resistance dryer which uses a 30 amp 240 volt circuit so a large reduction in the amount of electricity needed and that's why these things are two to three hundred percent more efficient than electric resistance and also now because they are condensing dryer they are ventless so they don't have to be an exterior wall you don't have that dryer vent going to the outside so it improves your air tightness and they can be placed anywhere you want in the building as long as you have the plug a water line and a drain there are also heat pump dryers they're a little more efficient than a condensing dryer um, you just want to make sure if you're picking these that you don't have the hybrid type which still has that electric resistance backup so you want one that has that small 15 amp 120 volt circuit not the big plug and a little bit more on on dryers and what clothes washing is that from a kind of amount of energy or amount of carbon that is um, expended over the whole life of washing the vast majority of it over two-thirds has to do with the temperature so if we would all just use no heat the very cold setting or no heat setting on our washers and then use tide cold or some other type of cold water specific scientifically formulated uh, washing detergent, then we would save a lot of energy and a lot of garbage emissions from our washing. Moving to the next appliance, we now are swapping our gas range for an electric range. And we wanna use the range, which has the cooktop and the oven on one appliance. We don't want to use separate induction cooktop and a separate induction wall oven, or sorry, separate resistance wall oven, because those two appliances would then need two 40 amp, 240 volt circuits versus that one range, which only needs one 40 amp, 240 volt circuits. Because basically the range has built in load sharing in that both the oven and the cooktop elements won't come on at the same time. The other big advantage is by going to an electric version from a gas cooktop, you produce much less harmful indoor air pollutants um, from the cooking and the burning of your food. And you also don't have the small methane leaking from the natural gas into your building. Finally, we're probably gonna want to electrify our domestic hot water as lots of us have natural gas hot water tanks. So here we're going to most likely use what is called a heat pump hot water tank or sometimes called a hybrid electric heat pump hot water tank. And the biggest trick here is when we're buying that piece of equipment, we want to use one that is 15 amps, 240 volts, as opposed to 30 amps, 240 volts. They are a little harder to find, so order early. Other tricks when you go to this heat pump hot water tank is you wanna use a bigger capacity tank. So probably almost always buy an 80 gallon tank. That way it can stay in the heat pump mode longer. The advantage is that heat pump mode only uses about 500 watts of electricity versus that electric resistance uses either 3,600 for the 15 amp or 3,600 watts for the 15 amp version or 7,200 watts for the 30 amp version. And there's also um, some smaller 15 amp 240, sorry, 15 amp 120 volt heat pump hot water tanks that are coming out. They're available in the States. I'm not sure if they're totally available in Canada yet, but probably will be in a year or two. They don't have the electric resistance backup. Um, so they might be good for smaller apartments or smaller homes uh, that don't need a whole lot of hot water um, back to back to back. And if you want to use one of the split systems of hot water tanks where you have an outdoor condenser and indoor unit, the sand and CO2 one is the most popular. It also uses 15 amps, 240 volt circuits. But again, large reduction from the 30 amp, 240 volt option. And then finally, last step of the watt, or the, one of the last steps of the watt diet is doing that deep energy retrofit or the building envelope upgrades. Uh, so either deep energy, 
deep energy retrofit standard or the benefit standard or uh, various other different standards. But basically what we're trying to do is to get the building envelope improved enough so that the peak heating load, the highest amount of electricity or energy we need to keep that house warm on the coldest days is about eight kilowatts or less, which means it'll fit on one 30 to 40 um, amp 240 volt circuit. So very rough targets for this deep energy retrofits is get your air tightness down below one. If you have two by four walls, add six inches of insulation, which is about effective R24 to those walls. If you have two by six walls, add about R16 effective to those walls. Try to get new triple pane windows with the U value. That's kind of the opposite of R values, less than one watt per meter squared Kelvin. Insulate at least one bo foot below grade. Um, down to the footings is better, but only slightly. And if you have a vented attic, put in about R80 effective insulation into that attic. Um, deep energy retrofits are expensive. Uh, they have long financial paybacks. So most often, and we'll see in some examples at the end of the, the presentation, they are paired with some type of comfort or other um, upgrades to the building. Um, this entires the whole process. And often the process is actually split up into different steps over different years. That's fine. You just want to make sure that your first step is to come up with a plan for the whole building so that each individual step is thought out and something you do first doesn't make something you do last more complicated. So an example of this is if you want to put solar on first and you have a cathedral type ceiling, you want to make sure you're improving the uh, insulation and air tightness of that cathedral ceiling before you put the solar panels on. But if you have a vented attic, which most homes do, then you could put the solar on right away, just kind of plan out that you're likely, when you fully electrify, your chimney is going to go away. So you might be able to put another solar panel at that location later. So once we've done the building envelope upgrades, that heating demand is low enough that we can now cost effectively put in a HVAC system, heating, ventilation, air conditioning system that runs on electricity. And this would be using a heat pump air handler. So it both heats and cools your building. It replaces your existing furnace. It looks kind of like a furnace. It just runs off heat pump instead of natural gas. And we want to then use either a cold climate air source heat pump to um, run the, the system. Right now, those in an Alberta's climate, because the current technology for air source heat pumps only really works down to minus 25 degrees Celsius, we're going to need some type of supplemental electric resistance heat as a backup. Or we could use a ground source heat pump that uses the ground as the uh, uh, heat sink. So because of that, it doesn't need any supplemental heat. But that's basically what we're changing the uh, HVAC system, how to heat and cool our building. We want to add a energy recovery ventilator. This provides a continuous filtered fresh air. An energy recovery ventilator is similar to a heat recovery ventilator, HRV, except the energy recovery ventilator also recovers the moisture. So you get a bit of moisture and heat recovery, which that moisture recovery is really good in our dry Alberta climate. And we want to use as much of your existing ductwork as possible. So kind of after doing all these things, what is our electrical panel going to look like? Quite often that cold climate air source heat pump is going to reuse the electric dryer circuit that has been now freed up. The ERV is going to use the old furnace circuit. The all-in-one washer and condensing dryer is just going to use the old washer circuit. And the only real new circuit we're adding to the panel is our hybrid electric heat pump hot water circuit. So not many changes, but you're probably asking, how do I add that air source heat pump supplementary electric resistance heat? I want an EV charger and I want a big solar array. So how do we add those? So the answer is we use what is called a load share device. And a load share device is any electrical device that allows the connection of additional appliances or loads to an existing electrical panel board, but doesn't increase the peak load calculation for that panel board. There's two main types. The names vary from location to location, but what I, I've seen most often uh, is a primary and secondary load share device or a circuit pauser. Uh, these pieces of are electrical equipment, so they must be installed by an electrician and you do need to pull an electric permit to install these. So briefly, the primary and secondary type of load share device, as the name kind of implies, you have one breaker, use that breaker to go to the primary and secondary device, and then you have two appliances. 
One is the primary, it always has power. The second is the secondary. It has power only when the primary is off. So this is good for when you have two appliances that have similar loads, but run at different times. Here's an example of a number of uh, these products that are available in Alberta or in Canada. Generally, they cost in the 850 to kind of higher end is the $1,300 range, and it's about an hour or two of, a, of a electrician's labor to install them. The other type is they called a circuit pauser. So for this one, it connects to one breaker on the panel and then, and then sends that uh, to a box and that box then connects to your new appliance. Single appliance, or it could be a, 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 a sub panel if you wanted, but then it controls when that power goes to that new appliance by monitoring the main power on the panel. So it monitors the main power on the panel. If it goes above 80% or a set value, then it turns off the power to that new appliance. Once it drops back down, then it turns the power back on. So this is the best for those EV chargers because then you can put a big EV charger on and still be able to charge overnight when most of your other appliances will be off. Again, here are some examples of them. Costs about the same uh, uh, labor and and material costs to install them. So another type of equipment, kind of one step up from a load share device is called a smart electric panel. These most often replace the whole electrical panel. So they're best kind of for, for new builds or if you have um, lots of different circuits that need to be monitored. And the advantage of these is each individual circuit on the panel is monitored can be controlled and can be prior prioritized so that the total load never goes over that selectable value. So you could connect a whole bunch of things on there, say I never wanna go over 100 amps, and it says, here's my priorities. As I start to get close to that, these are the circuits you turn off. So it's a good option if you need more than one load share device to stay under that 100 amps, or if you're, uh, as part of your retrofit or your new build, you're looking to integrate, integrate batteries, a backup generator, solar PV system, or multiple different units maybe in a house, then these type of smart electrical panels might be a good option. There's a number of them available. The Coben Genius is kind of the most available in Canada. Span isn't currently available in Canada. The Lumen Smart Panel is, and there are a few more other ones that are soon to be released. Uh, kind of the downside to these is they cost at least about $5,000 to buy, and the labor is much more intensive because you're basically reconnecting all of the individual uh, circuits. So now we're gonna circle back to my, why we want to get solar PV on the roof as quick as possible. And these two graphs are kind of the reason why. Um, so as part of electrification, the solar PV system is often added. It's not required, but as you can see, right now on the production side, Alberta is still a very, fossil fuel heavy production side. So most of the production, 70% uh, or 75% of the annual production is still fossil fuel um, driven. So if we want to actually get those greenhouse gas emissions down, we need to be producing electricity on site. So we're getting very good at adding more solar. That's the first graph. The coal is dropping down, it's at 7% and still dropping, and renewables is up to about 30% and increasing, but we still have more work to do because on the whole annual production, we're still a very fossil fuel heavy. So we want to have those on-site solar as fast as we can, so that we're producing that um, low carbon electricity as much as we want, or as fast as we can. So you might wanna put your solar PV on earlier on your process of your deep energy retrofit. So how do we add that large solar panel system? Because if we don't, um, if we don't think about it, it can also trigger a electrical service upgrade. And why is that? So before I answer the why, I have to say what the problem is. <clears throat> so firstly, solar PV is generation. It produces electricity, it is not consumption. So a solar system does not affect the calculation of your panel peak load, but solar panels, solar PV systems can increase the current that is flowing through your bus bars. So your next question is, what's a bus bar? I have that same question. 
basically the bus bars are kind of like the wires and they carry the electricity within your electrical panel from the wires that come from the transmission to each individual breaker. And there's a whole bunch of electrical code um, calculations on how much electricity can be flowing through those bus bars. So generally speaking, that solar PV system wants to be connected at the bottom of the panel. So the, its generation comes from the bottom and your grid electricity comes from the top. And hopefully, and theoretically, they never meet. But again, there's a whole bunch of code clauses to make sure that that is a safe connection. And basically the code clauses come out that if you are wanting to attach a solar PV system that generates more than 4.8 kilowatts of AC power, it will overload that 100 amp bus bar. And that 4.8 kilowatts of, of generation is generally not sufficient to fully electrify a net zero on-site energy home. So we want a larger bus bar for a larger solar PV system. How do we do that? Well, first of all, just check your panel because lots of panels are actually a 120 amp bus bar, not a 100. So if you just open up your panel, there should be a sticker on it. The sticker's got a whole bunch of numbers. If you see in those numbers 125, it's probably a 125 amp bus bar panel. If you just see 100, it's probably 100 amp. The nice thing is if you have a 100 amp bus bar panel and the main breaker is 100 amps, sorry, if you have 125 amp bus bar, that is the size of your panel, and a 100 amp breaker, then you can have about 40 amps, 240 volt uh, circuit for your PV, which means you can have a system that creates 9.6 kilowatts instantaneous AC power, which is a pretty big system. If you still want a bigger system, then you could pull out the panel and put in a 200 amp rated panel, which means you have a 200 amp bus bar. And then just for future proofing, I would still install a 200 amp cable from your panel to your electrical meter, but then you only still install that 100 amp main breaker, which means you have 100 amp service, because that way you can now have up to a 28.8 kilowatt uh, AC solar array, which is far more than you'd ever need. The other and this upgrade to a 200 amp panel from just a typical 60 to 100 amp panel is only about $375. So if you're upgrading anyways, or if you're building new, just put in that 200 amp, 200 amp rated panel with a 100 amp breaker. The other way, if your panel is far away from your meter, you can also use um, equipment that is called a splitter to split the electricity at the meter base into two feeds, one that feeds your solar PV system and one that feeds your panel. There's different options on what this can look like. Make sure you check with your local um, safety codes officer to make sure you find one that is acceptable to them and all the different options uh, that are acceptable to the city of Calgary and I believe the city of Edmonton are included in the report. So now let's look at two examples of deep energy retrofits and electrifications that we're both able to do this without a service upgrade. So here's the first one, uh, fairly typical split level uh, built prior to 1970. It had a 100 amp service, 240 volt panel, had a fossil fuel, fossil fuel furnace, hot water tank and clothes dryer. Uh, it did have an electric range, it did have an electric dryer connection on the panel, even though it had a gas dryer. Two by four walls, vented attic, and this building, its EnerGuide rating was 134 gigajoules of energy per year. So what do they do as part of their deep energy retrofit? So after the deep energy retrofit, they were able to drop their gigajoules on the energy audit down to 49 gigajoules before they added solar. So saved almost 100 gigajoules of energy. Uh, they were able to retain the 100 amp electrical service. They did install the all-in-one washer and condensing dryer. And as far as the envelope improvements, they added eight insulation, eight inches of insulation around the walls, eight inches of insulation on the walls below grade, and 14 inches of insulation into the attic. They replaced all the windows with triple pane windows. Their air changes were dropped from 5.8 air changes per hour down to 1.2 air changes per hour. These building envelope upgrades now allowed them to use an air source, cold climate air source heat pump for their heating and cooling of the building. They used a heat pump hot or hybrid heat pump hot water tank for their hot water. They put in an ERV 
to give them fresh filtered air that recycles the heating some moisture and uh, heat and they cut the fossil fuel line so this cost was fairly large it's 130 to 180 thousand dollars but the other advantage to the homeowners is their roof needed to be re redone anyways their siding was getting near the end of life their windows were single pane aluminum sliders so they really couldn't open them in the winter because they were frosted up so they had a whole bunch of maintenance that they had to do anyways and also by doing this and electrifying, they got rid of their chimney and they were able to relocate some of the mechanical room furnace and other stuff into kind of a uh, crawl space. So they got a lot more living space out of it. They're able to make kind of a very small um, crowded um, home office into a much more comfortable home office as both parents work from home. So again, they're combining it with a whole bunch of other comfort and uh, other upgrades it's not just for the energy reasons alone so the second one this is a newer building uh, so newer built built after 2010 by a large production builder and its starting energide rating was 143 gigajoules so it's actually used more energy than our 1970s house uh had code minimum Building envelope, but still lots of service life left in that building envelope. But the fossil fuel furnace being kind of 10, 13 years old was nearing the end of its life. It had an electric range, vented attic, two by six walls. So what did they do? So they did kind of what they call the no demolition uh, type of deep energy retrofit. So the only envelope upgrade was to use the aero barrier uh, aerosolized uh, caulking system to improve the air tightness. They brought it down to about 1.2 and they installed a ground source heat pump. So this involved three, uh, that large piece of equipment you see in the photo there, drilling three uh, vertical bore holes on their property that goes back to a, a larger um, air source, or sorry, ground source heat pump. And then they were, again, fully to, able to fully electrify their building, cut the fossil fuel line, didn't initially, but they eventually put in a condensing dryer and their cost was about $106,000. About 68,000 was for the ground source heat pump, 28,000 for the uh, solar, uh, about 5,000 for the aero barrier, and then $6,000 for kind of other electrical and other permits. And both of these were able to save some greenhouse gas emissions. Both of these were able to reduce their electrical demand, but, um, so the second house did put a six, 9.6 .6 kilowatt solar PV array on it. Their panel was that 125 amp, but 100, uh, 125 amp bus bar with 100 amp. But when they did that peak load calculations after all their improvements, the peak load calculations came out to 104 amps. So they were very close. But because of that, they did have to increase the electrical service from 100 to 125 amps. But that was the size of the panel before. But unfortunately, they were earlier on in kind of the pilot program. So the splitter options to install that large solar PV system weren't acceptable to the local jurisdiction. So they actually had to pull out their what otherwise could have been useful 125 amp panel and put a 100 or sorry, a 200 amp panel back in. So this is a good example of do that peak load calculation before you start doing work to make sure you're are under that 100 amps and make sure you talk to your local um, um, local jurisdiction to make sure you pick a splitter that is acceptable. So kind of a few last things to make sure we're optimizing our PV. We want to make sure we're putting most of those solar panels on the south facing roofs. They will produce the most, but solar is now low enough cost that a little bit on the east and west facing roofs might be good because it makes we are uh, now producing electricity for longer hours of the day and all electricity is consumed from the grid has distribution fees added to it so we want to stay off of the grid as much as we can we want to use all that production for our homes needs for as long as possible and only then export it to the grid even if you're not installing a battery right now i would plan for a battery leave some space and plan for a bi-directional charging from your EV. And even if you don't fill your whole roof, plan for filling your whole roof, even if you can't afford it now, this basically just means that the wires going to this roof are large enough for the full installation of solar, even if you don't put the panels up now. So basically, as a conclusion, have your electrical electrician perform that panel board load calculation early and check with the local authority to make sure that the um, everything is acceptable to them before you start construction and order materials. 
All of the electrification myths that say it can't be done, even in cold climate Alberta, are false. It can be done, it has been done, we will continue to do it. And for both individual and societal benefit reasons, we want to make sure we are electrifying without a service upgrade, which is a proven and achievable goal with the minimized cost associated with it. That's the end of my presentation. Here's my email if you want to get in contact with me. And now we'll uh, open up to questions. Well, thanks very much, Frank. Every time I hear from you, I learn more and more. So I appreciate that. If you want to take your screen share down now so that you look bigger to our audience, that would be great. A uh, reminder to everyone in attendance that we're using the Q&A box, not the chat box for questions. So if you have questions, they need to go in the Q&A box. And I would ask that you please upvote the questions you like, because there's no way we're going to get through all of them. So I want to make sure we're prioritizing your favorite questions and also not repeating too much, hopefully. Alrighty, Frank. Well, let's get started. We got to dive into a lot of questions coming fast and furious here. Paul says, I would love to get a battery installed with my system, but it was so expensive. <laughs> Do you see any evidence that the cost of battery storage is coming down? Yeah, it, it's battery storage is doing kind of the same decrease in cost that solar has done. It just started at a higher rate and hasn't as far down it. So yes, I wouldn't right now in Alberta, batteries are probably more uh, more costly than justified unless you have some grid stability issues. But as I said, I would probably plan for the space in your electrical room, know where it's gonna go, so it makes it easier to install it in the future. Yeah, and I have heard that storage also, I think, has to go in, um, not in your residence. So there also probably needs to be space outside of the residence too, in addition to the electrical box components, I think. So yeah, it, there's there's probably lots of details. Lots um, of rules. Check, check your codes <laughs> yeah. outside or inside, plan for it. But yeah, yeah it is expensive now. Yeah, that stuff seems to always be changing. So we do have a lot of members who, who are experienced with batteries. So if folks want to reach out to them as well on our, our directory, that's another option too. Um, Julia is wondering, should I electrify my home first or install solar PV first? You did touch on that, but I think it would be worthwhile to re review again. So you could do either first. The more you electrify, the larger the solar panel system can be. So if you're not fully electrified, make sure you that you are planning out your full solar system, basically filling your roof and installing conduit and cable and breakers for the full system. You, the system can be installed in different sections. Um, using microinverters is the best way to do that because it's much easier to in, uh, increase this, the system with microinverters than one large uh, string inverter in the basement. But mm -hmm. you can do it either or, but plan out the full system under full electrification at the start. Yeah, I wish we had done that actually, because we did our system and then got an EV. And now that we're looking to expand our system, there's a lot of unnecessary additional upgrades <laughs> needed. So uh, we should have had that conversation right at the get go too. Um, and this is related to that actually. Justin is talking dollars here. And part, part of the reason we went with solar first was because we just couldn't afford the EV for at first. Uh, and, and so we got it second, which was maybe backwards. But Justin's asking about money too here. He says, I don't have a thousand uh, $100,000. Uh, if you were to recommend one thing that gives me the best bang for my buck in terms of electrifying my home. What would you recommend? Love that question. Well, the, the best bang for your buck is get your energy audit, but then pay the extra thousand dollars and get a full deep energy retrofit plan from one of the energy auditors that are experienced doing that. That's your best bang for your buck because now you have a plan on where you want to get to. And then next you can sit down with that energy advisor or energy efficiency consultant and say, here's my money. Here's the SEEP or the Greener Homes Loan, the Greener Homes Grant. Here's how I can access funding. And then you put based on what you can um, fund in different layers and different steps. But yeah, biggest bang for your buck, pay the money to get a plan that shows you the start to finish. Yeah, the plan is there to help you prioritize, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's the goal of the plans. And that's, I think, why a lot of municipalities and the Greener Homes Grant are even requiring those plans. You know, they're saying, people are saying, why do I have to get that done? <laughs> Probably for this very reason, to help folks prioritize, hey? Well, so, so to that, the like $500 energy audit, 
is not a deep energy retrofit plan. It costs about another thousand dollars on top of that by specialized or people have done it more often to get a full deep energy retrofit plan. The Greener Homes Grant Energy Audit recommended updates are a very generic drop down. Um, there, there is no plan associated with that. Okay, so one step above that, the deep energy audit. Okay, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, what about tank versus on-demand hot water systems? What is preferable? If you're going all electric and you want to stay on 100 amps, it needs to be a tank. Uh, all electric on-demand systems are a huge amount of electricity because you're trying to take two degree water and instantaneously take it up to 45 degrees Celsius. So you want a tanked option. Okay, interesting. There might be some new technology in the future that changes that dynamic a bit. So I remember being at SAIT and seeing they had some kind of on-demand salt process they were testing out. <laughs> and that was so really interesting, but, yeah. uh, you know. As I understand that that's more uh, thermal storage that allows oh. your tank to be bigger than it is by um, melting a phase change material. So it just gives you more density of hot water in a smaller volume. Ah, thank you. But yes, te that. technology might change, but right now a tank yeah. is your really only option for electrifying on 100 amps. Yeah, as you were talking, I was like, we're just going to have to have you back every year, Frank, because there's always something new, right? A new product. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Uh, Vern is saying, I have solar on the roof and an electric car out front. I've been thinking about adding battery storage. Any thoughts from the crowd or you, of course, about potential return on investment? Well, if you have an EV in the, in the garage, you have a giant battery in that EV. So I would just hope that either you installed a bi-directional um, charger so that you can take energy from the, the EV, or you maybe at some point swap that out to a bi-directional charger. I don't really see the need because your, your EV is probably a 30 to 80 kilowatt hour battery. Most home batteries are like $10,000 for a five kilowatt battery. So use the EV. Would that apply even to a short range EV, Frank? Because I, 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 okay, so I think the Leaf is still 30. Okay. I think the Leaf still has a 30 apply. kilowatt hour battery. I could be wrong. Oh. But. Okay, I just I was curious the other day because I was like, is this a long range consideration or short range too? So that's good to know. Uh, Maria wondering, can a condensing air dryer, oh, sorry, can a condensing dryer also recirculate moisture to humidify the home? Yes, so all condensing dryers and heat pump dryers, when they are working, provide a little bit or exhaust a little bit of warm, moist air into the building. So if they're in a closet, you got to make sure you open the closet door or else it doesn't have enough airflow. Uh, so yeah, in the winter, it's great. It provides you a little warm, moist air. Uh, in the summer, it's, I guess, not ideal. I've never, I have one of these in my house. It's never overheated my house. And yes, in the winter, it is nice. It does provide some warm, moist air into the house, but make sure you're not hiding it in the cupboard with a closed door or else it won't work as efficiently as it should. And it will just take mm. longer to dry. Okay, thanks, Frank. Jenny has a question here, which, I'll partially help with the answer as well. Um, where do we find the list of audit companies to start with the priority list? I'm going to let you answer, Frank, but I also want to plug our directory there when you're done. <laughs> yeah. So when you sign up for the Greener Home Grant, there is a list that comes pre-populated. <clears throat> if you're looking to do that full deep energy retrofit grant, then really the ones that are the best right now are for Element Integrated Design, Eco Synergy. Uh, those are the ones in Calgary. Um, I don't know all the ones that are really good in Edmonton, but if you go to the uh, Retrofit Canada website, they have a whole bunch of case studies on all these deep energy retrofits, and you can kind of see who has done it before. Or you just phone around from that list on the Greener Homes Grant website or the Solar Alberta website to say, have you done a deep energy retrofit? And if so, what does that cost? And then uh, pick one of those people. Yeah, I was going to add that, you know, our directory is not solar exclusive. So we do have a lot of green home builders, uh, energy advisors, consultants, you name it. Uh, if they care about the environment, we try and find a way to list them. So you can definitely check there as well. And Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Retrofit Canada was even working on sort of a kind of a a video or some kind of document to, to kind of show people, well, if you have to do it in, in you know, what order or bite-sized pieces, you can kind of chunk it up into these bite-sized pieces too. Yep. Yeah, SAIT, uh, and I was on part of that grant group, uh, SAIT and a number of other um, industry experts have created a deep energy retrofit guidebook, uh, which can be used to kind of help walk you through or 
explains you what the process is going to be. And uh, you can just search that on SAIT's website, or uh, I believe it's on Retrofit Canada's uh, website as well, as well, but Deep Energy Retrofit Guidebook. Mm, nice. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, have you encountered situations where the installation of solar panels on the roof required upgrading of the roof trusses to support the added weight of the solar panels? Generally, no, as long as they are parallel with the roof, um, because then there's no added snow load and they're fairly low, so there's no added um, wind load. Generally, no. But if you're doing yeah. them angled up, then definitely yes. Yeah, I think someone mentioned once that sometimes it depends on the age of the building, because apparently, like yeah. newer buildings, it's pretty standard for them to support three pounds per square foot. But occasionally you'll get an older building where they didn't have those same build standards. <laughs> and so I guess there might be a couple of exceptions there, but uh, definitely an interesting conversation. Um, yeah. and, and I have heard commercial roofs are. Commercial much... roofs because they're flat and they're all going to be somewhat angled up. Yes, you are adding more wind load and uh, mm -hmm. re redistributing where the snow load is going to collect. So yes, mm -hmm. flat roofs definitely uh, need a structural engineer. Most sloped vented, vented or cathedral ceilings shouldn't but mm -hmm. uh, it's not 100 percent. yeah thank you okay i think we just have time for one or two more questions here so paul's got one here i had solar panels uh, installed on my home in late august and i'm very curious and confused about solar clubs i see nmax now seems to have one currently locked in on a cheap rate um and with, with nmax would like to keep paying that rate if possible if i switch will i be able to get that rate back <laughs> you if, yeah, if, you're if you're locked in with a low nmax rate i would probably stay on that rate at least till the summer and then in the summer then it's the, the decision do you want to change that high solar club i don't know if nmax is the same solar club generally it's all one they solar club one. that is all run by utility net um so three now, just yeah. oh there's three different solar clubs okay yeah so just do some research but yeah if, if you're locked into that low um, winter rate stay on it for as long as you can until you're ready to swap over to the high rate and then then do some shopping great advice yeah we do have a blog because uh, we were told about the three now i guess ace and max and then the solar club um, they all have their own solar specific pricing plans now. So uh, we did do a blog on it this year because we now know there are at least three programs out there. So you can look on our homepage for our blog for a little bit more about that. But I love your advice to <laughs> wait till the summer before you switch. Um, that makes a lot of sense or, or spring, I guess, at least. Um, thank you for that. Okay, I'm gonna read one last question here and then thank you for sharing your email address earlier in case people need to follow up. Uh, Omen's wondering, what is the difference between electric power measurement kilowatts and electric energy measurement kilowatt hours? What does each signify from a solar generation calculation? So a watt is a unit of energy. It's like the light bulb takes six watts to run or things keep take so much energy to run. Think of it as the horsepower of your car. Kilowatt hours is amount of power, it is energy over time watts per hour so think of that like the uh, miles per gallon of your car so one is how much energy something uses and the other one is energy over time which is power and that kilowatt hours is what we see on our um, electricity bill because we consume electricity over time in kilowatt hours um, and then if we buy appliances they will be rated in watts that's how much electricity they draw Hmm. Thank you. I think that's a, a really good place to end. And I really just want to say thank you so much, Frank. This has been uh, very illuminating and electrifying. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, to Passive House for lending you to us for the day. Appreciate that. Uh, always great to have that partnership with you folks. Uh, a big thanks to our audience for attending. Lots of great questions today. I love it. Thank you. Keep them coming all week. Uh, of course, we have sessions going tomorrow and Friday. You're welcome to join us. And of course, thanks to the City of Calgary and Enbridge for sponsoring this session today. We really couldn't provide all of this free programming without our sponsors and our wonderful partners like Frank and Passive House Alberta. So thanks very much. Have a great day, everyone, and look forward to seeing you tomorrow.